Well, good morning. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to our 915 talk. It's my pleasure to have my good friend for the last few months, Reverend Bill here with us. He's an amazing person and uh, we look, look forward to having a great session with him. So over to you, Reverend. Please introduce yourself and take us wherever you're taking us. Wow. Well, it's my honor. First off, it's my honor to be your friend. And it hasn't been just a few months. You know, and I know that it's much longer stretching lifetimes. There's a connection. But uh, I was up this morning. Here's a life lesson just to start off with. I was up this morning. And it was just before 3 o'clock, which is about normal for me. And by the time, a little after 4, I already had my three-mile morning walk in the darkness and the quiet and the solitude. And then you come back and you meditate, you pray, and then you catch up with your correspondence and, uh, and you have breakfast and you shower. I've already got six or seven hours of my day done, but good morning to you guys. It's nighttime there, I'm assuming, right? <laughs> I'm a, uh, a seeker, for lack of a better term. People keep trying to put a label on me. Some people call me a mystic, somebody call me a psychic, somebody calls me a teacher. Uh, we are all seekers, and especially if you're on this broadcast right now, we're all here looking for the same thing. And uh, I've had a lot of interesting things. I don't know if anybody in this group has had an opportunity to see any of my videos or read any of my books or watch any of my interviews on TV or radio. And I yeah, never know where people, they... uh, We posted your yeah. uh, video, so most people must have watched it, I guess. Okay. So I never come prepared for anything because I totally trust the universe. I trust God. Uh, and my morning prayer is always, let me be there for those that need it. Let the words come. Let the stories come. Um, this last month has been kind of interesting. Uh, if you're looking at my face now, it may look a little ragged, but I've had four, five surgeries in four months on my face and, you know, the, the nose and the cheeks. And I've had 68 stitches in my face. Had my beard shaved off, growing it back a couple of times. So this ragged old guy sitting in front of you uh, is holding his life together and everything is perfect. I mean, I'll, honestly, people say, how are you doing? I mean, they've seen me go through all these different things in the last few months with my cancer treatments and all this other stuff. And you know what? Honestly, I have never been in better emotional and spiritual health. And to me, that is the, the epitome of, of why you get up in the morning. If you get up in the morning, it's another beautiful day. Sleep is like a, a mini death. It's like a rebirth in the morning and you have an opportunity to start new and start fresh. I've found from counseling people over the years, spiritual counseling, especially people with uh, long-term problems like PTSD or they've had a, a bad childhood or bad uh, uh, war experiences or whatever it may be, 90% of their problem is remembering. So to me, when you wake up in the morning, forget the past. Live in this moment, this now, and enjoy each moment. So I, I deal with uh, veterans uh, who have PTSD from the wars, various wars. And one of the things is that they keep re-remembering the same events in their lives. You know, it might have been just a, a one day event or a part of a year, but that seems to be the dominant factor for the rest of their life. It's for some people, it's a bad marriage, it's bad parents, bad job, it's their health, it's their wealth. It matters not. The key in, to happiness is you only got to remember this moment. And this is all about love. And that's kind of where I, I take my sermons and, and my talks and lectures around the world. And I give uh, seminars, I give retreats, I, I give lectures, and I, I try to show for the people who are there. So having said that, let me explain what happened this month, because this story that I'm going to tell will kind of give you an indication of my philosophy of life. About three weeks ago, literally three weeks ago, I bit into a piece of fruit that was supposed to have the pit out of it. It was a, a date. And the pit was not out to fit. And I bit into it and I broke three teeth. One tooth totally in half. And it jammed the piece of tooth 
right into the, the gum and into the nerve. It happened uh, in the morning on, on a Wednesday morning. And for the life of me, every dentist office I called never called me back. You know, in America, nobody went to the dentist in 2020. So they're all going now. So you can't even get an appointment. So I, I didn't worry about it, but I was in excruciating pain. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat, just breathe it in the cool air. Yeah, I don't know if you ever had a nerve exposed from dental work, just cool air on the nerve would you know, drive you crazy. So I, okay, I finally woke a dentist up in early in the morning on Friday and uh, I called a guy at home and I said, hey, you know, can you see me? He said, well, I don't know if I could do anything, but I'll see you. So I go in and he gives me x-rays, looks in there, and finally looks at me and says, yep, you're right. You got three broken teeth. I go, well, I knew that before I walked in before it cost me $200. And he's, he said, well, I can see you. Now, this is three weeks ago. I could see you July 28th. And I said, well, what part of this story about me not sleeping and me not eating did you understand? But I didn't get upset. I just said, you know, it'll all work out. I said, okay, all right. He said, well, if somebody cancels, if I can move you up, I will. I'm trusting the universe. And uh, a normal person would ask for pain pills, but I go, no, I'm good. And I was in real terrible pain. I went home and then practiced something I learned when I lived in Hawaii when I was a teenager in the Hawaiian Islands. I learned it from old Kahuna. Now, Kahuna religion is probably the closest thing in India that you have to Kahuna religion is the not tradition of yoga. And with sounds and 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 meditation, vibration and energy and healing, all that stuff. And one of the things I learned was every part of you, in fact, everything around you is alive, and everything thrives and heals with love. So I took my hands and I put my hands on my jaw, and I visualized my little teeth, my broken teeth, and I sold my teeth mentally. I go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I mistreated you. I'm sorry I broke you. Thank you for all the wonderful service you give me. And I love you. And I said this over and over in my head, like a mantra, but I meant it. I really loved my teeth. And I stopped and I was sitting in my chair. And, and then when I thought about it, I go, where's the pain? I, I realized someplace by the time I said I loved my teeth, so the time I actually thought about it, there was actually no pain. So someplace in that time period, it, it totally disappeared. I didn't ask for healing. I didn't, I didn't expect anything. I just wanted to love my teeth and say I was sorry. So then I, I had this uh, friend in, in uh, England, in London, and I had this thing about, I better call him. And I call him, I do a, a, a little Zoom chat with him. And I call him up and I go, I go, Steve. And, I, and I, I want to tell you a story. So I told him that whole story. He didn't say too much, but he didn't, he didn't look comfortable. So a few days later, when I called him, he said, you know, Bill, when you told me that story, I was in terrible dental pain. And I, I, can't, get a, I can't get a dentist in England until August. You know, it's like a worldwide problem, I guess. So, and I says, and I listened to your story. And 20 minutes after you hung up and disconnected, my pain went away. And I told that story to a woman on the East Coast of the United States in New York. And she was complaining about a shoulder injury and it was really hurting her. It was, it was, it'd been hurting her for a decade or two. And when I hung up on her, she said later that day, half the pain went away. It was, you know, she could kind of use it, but half was gone. So when I posted that story on a YouTube video with other details, which I'll give you, I posted that story on a YouTube video and within the first 12 hours, four people had contacted me and said, oh, Reverend Bill, I, I watched your video and I'm healed or I took away the pain or I'm half cured or I feel better. Since then, there's been dozens of people contacting me. They're not following exactly what I told. I thought they'd follow what I, you know, I thought they'd say, I love you and do all that stuff. 
most of just from watching the video itself, that the energy in the video and my story, that's all they needed. And for some people, they did it in different levels of success. So the other part about this, it goes on, and this is an experience that happened. When I first broke my teeth, people were sending these messages. Oh, poor Reverend Bill, you know, you should demand, you should go down that, that dentist and make them take you in there and you should do this, you should do that. And, and they're all upset for me. And I'm going, no, I'm not. it'll all happen. God will take care of me. So the fact that I, that was a Friday that I went in to see this guy. Uh, every day after that, I was getting messages from the staff. Oh, we can move you up another week. We can move you up another week, another week. Now, the problem was on that Monday, Friday I saw, on that Monday, I had what they call blue light treatment for my cancer. I sit under this ultraviolet machine and for a period of time. And when I leave there, uh, I'm photosensitive. In other words, bright light of any kind or sunshine, I'll blister up, you know, and that's like 72 hours like that. So I just made a note to the universe. Well, the universe knows about this. I mean, my, my appointment got moved up from July 29th and it kept going, 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 going. Pretty soon, Thursday, which is 79 hours after my blue light treatment, which was seven hours to the good. In other words, had they called me up and said, we could take you Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, I couldn't have gone in. But they called me up for Thursday, which was the first day that under this treatment I was getting that I could sit under the lights of the dentist. So I thought, oh, that's pretty good. That's good, you know, perfect timing. And then the dentist in America, they're always worried about getting paid. And I don't have dental insurance. So they go, you know, Reverend Bill, that's going to be uh, 600, about $625. I said, okay, no problem. That day in the afternoon, I opened up my mail and somebody had sent me two uh, gift cards, one for 100, one for 25. That was 125 bucks of lucky money, right? As you say in India, lucky money, right? Just come to me. I went to bed that night, and the next day, when I woke up getting ready to go to the dentist, I looked on my on my emails. I had a message from PayPal. Somebody in India had sent me five hundred dollar donation. That was six hundred twenty five dollars. So, what was it going to cost for the dentist? Six hundred twenty five dollars. So, <laughs> I walk in, no problem. So then, when I go into the dentist. The dentist, there's two dentists. There's a big job, right? There's two dentists there that are going to work on me. And the guy goes, these, these are really broken, really bad. I don't know if I can see. We might have to pull them. And it looks like you might have to have at least one, two root canals. And I go, go ahead, do whatever you got to do, right? See, when I go to a dentist's office or a doctor's office, I, I'm never really worried about anything because... That's the dentist's job. That's the doctor's job. They got all the stress. They got all the pressure. I don't have to do anything but open my mouth. And, and, and being an Irish friend, that's not a problem. I open my mouth all the time. So I go in there expecting to get a root canal and all this stuff. And then um, they get through in an hour, only an hour. And the dentist apologizes. He says, well, you know, I was able to fix it, fix all of it. No crown, they didn't pull any out, and no root canals. And uh, so there's an experience that I'm using this. Yeah, let me let me block this sun out here. So you guys can see me here. Maybe that's better, hopefully. That doesn't fall on the head. Oh, okay, forget it. I was trying to be a good guy. So I could have been despondent, I could have been angry, I could have been upset, but when things happen to me, I never judge this as, this is good, this is bad, uh, I'm, this, I'm a victim, I'm never a victim. To me, everything that happens to me in life is supposed to happen. Everything happens for a reason. And looking back on those broken teeth, 
the fact that so many other people got inspired, got helped, or some way affected their life, allowed them to handle their own pain or whatever. I would break those three teeth again on purpose if it had the same result. So it's, the story points out, it's not really what happens to us. It's how we look at it. So if you look at everything as a gift, those three broken teeth were the gift. Here I'm telling people all the time on how to heal their pain and all this kind of stuff. Well, that was a chance to demonstrate it. There it is. No pain pills, just do it. So that's been kind of the secret of my life. I tell people, if the people read my, my books and stuff, and they go, oh, holy, you've been blown up. You've been shot by a machine gun. You've been in helicopter crashes. You've been, everything's happened to you. You've had people have guns in your face. You've had, you know, knives at you. Oh, you know, you've been sick. You've been, and I go, yeah, it's all supposed to happen. It was just tough. Everything that's ever happened in my life was supposed to happen. Therefore, nothing in my life ever happened to me that was wrong. I was never in my life a victim, ever. And if you go through your life looking at everything as it's, it's all as it's supposed to be, then you can never get upset. You never get angry. You don't get mad. And you find the gifts that come from every life experience. Because every life experience is a gift. When I was a young man, I was a young kid, actually eight years old, I was uh, so sick. I had a kidney disease, a lung disease, and several other diseases all at the same time. And uh, they took my, they took me, and they put me in a hospital, and I was in isolation and everything. I spent almost a full year of my life in a hospital bed. Uh, visitors once a week for about ten minutes on Sundays, and it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. People go, "What do you mean the best thing that ever happened to you?" No toys, no TV, no radio, no iPhones, smartphones, no computers, no iPads, no no music, nothing, not even school. It was nothing. So every day I woke up when they, uh, the shift changed of the doctors and the nurses at six o'clock in the morning, they'd wake me up. And I, and I wouldn't go back to sleep until they turned the lights off at nine o'clock at night. And every day I was in my mental and spiritual cave. I did pull back and, and I had this free time. I'm going, what in my life am I gonna get a chance to have absolutely zero responsibilities? Don't have to be anywhere, don't have to be in school, don't have to study anything, don't have to read anything, don't have to remember. All I got every day is my heart and my mind. And so using the power of visualization, and this spiritual creativeness, which I, I thought I was inventing my own meditation techniques. And then on my first trip to India in uh, 2004, I was in the Himalayas, and this Tibetan Buddhist monk who didn't speak English, I didn't speak Tibetan. We spent three lovely days together, and I learned more from that man than I learned from anybody. Without him speaking a word of English, just takes me, you know, didn't even know, just walks up to me, takes me, sits me down, and he teaches me this technique where you breathe the energy in through your navel and, you know, and, and this whole thing. And, and I'm going, and then this thing about, you know, pushing your eyes, your nostril, and closing your ears and all. And I'm going, wait a minute. I thought I'd made up all that stuff when I was a kid. So at eight years old, I was doing this thing that this Tibetan monk was sharing with me when I was uh, 58 and a half years old. So it was really interesting. But when I was in that hospital, going back on that, I'll give you a little near-death experience to touch on it because that kind of gives you the trajectory of where my life was going to go. First night there, uh, they took me in and they, they put these big needles in my back and they were withdrawing fluids from my lungs and everything. And uh, not a lot of, nobody was holding my hands. There was no, there was no love. There was no affection. There was no... We're sorry, kid. There was nothing. It was just sit down, move, boom, boom, boom. And I got through and they put me in this bed and turned the lights off. And I was so far gone. And they already told my parents I probably was going to die. 
you know, they should make plans. And I'm laying there in my bed in this dark room. All of a sudden, the room just keeps getting lighter and lighter and lighter. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I'm looking at something that should be blinding me. It's bright. And, and I realized that I'm kind of floating. I look down and there's, there's my body, the body of an eight-year-old child laying there in bed, peaceful, but not doing anything, not moving, not breathing, not doing anything else. And I'm kind of sitting on top of this body, sitting up. And then there's feeling of love, great love. For those that, uh, you, know, you know, when you get a, uh, when you get an Indian grandmother that loves her grandchild, you know that feeling that they, you know they hug them and they can't get enough. Picture one million Italian grandmothers, you know, or or or, or Indian grandmothers or anybody's grandmothers hugging you, right? It felt like I was so loved. It was just a well that just kept getting full and more full and overflowing. So there was this feeling of love and the light just kept getting brighter. Then pretty soon there was this like clouds in the room. And then it was like this movie. It was like images of things that were going to happen to me over the next 50 years. I didn't know it was the next 50 years when I was watching it. I wasn't quite sure what it was, but I'm watching that and I'm seeing, seeing my present wife, the same wife I, I met in high school. And, uh, places I've lived, uh, I saw the war with helicopters. I saw President of the United States getting killed, John F. Kennedy. I saw all these things I didn't fully quite understand. I didn't know who Kennedy was. I didn't know about the war in Vietnam. Um, and I certainly didn't know any of these people. That were, but I saw this whole panorama for a period of time. It could have been an hour in real time. In the no time zone that I was in, it felt like it was forever. It just kind of rolled on. And when I lived the next 50 years of my life, everything was like deja vu. Things would happen. Just, just as things were starting to happen, I go, oh, wait a minute. I know, how this, I know how this comes out. I know what's going to happen here. So like when I was in high school, I was having these uh, dreams, quote unquote dreams, these vision dreams showing President uh, uh, John F. Kennedy being killed. And I knew it was Texas. And I saw all these images and stuff. So I went to school and I told a few people, I told my school principal, you know, Kennedy's gonna get, the president's gonna get killed in Dallas next week. Yeah, Bill. Yeah, okay, settle down. Now, if this was today with with the internet and everything, if I, if I was eight, eight, nine year old, and I put on there, Kennedy was going. The president was going to get killed, and then he got killed. I'm sure I would have had men in black suits uh, at my doorstep the next day. But back then, we just thought I was crazy. So, but everything in my life just kind of fell into place. And one of the things about that vision I had, which I didn't understand at all at the time, was I kept seeing these rotating numbers, kind of just in the cloud. There was a two, nine, and it kind of, the two flipped over and it looked like a five. So it was 29, 59. And I didn't understand what that meant. I, I thought, well, maybe at 29, something's gonna happen to me. Maybe at 59, I don't know, maybe I'm gonna die at those ages or something. And for a long time, I thought that. And then I met some astrologer and he goes, oh, that's your Saturn. You know, every 29, almost every 29 years or so. And at 59, it comes back. and. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe it's that. But what happened was I had a heart attack. Yeah, I've had 12 major heart attacks, but I had a heart attack in India on this first trip to India, which uh, produced my second near death experience. I'm hiking up to Babaji's cave, the one that you read about in Autobiography of a Yogi, the actual cave. It's someplace that I vowed. When I was eight, nine years old, when I read Autobiography by Paramount Yogananda, I vowed that someday I'm going to find that cave. I'm going there. 
you know, they didn't advertise. They knew where it was at or anything. It was kind of like a big secret for decades, but I was going to find it and I was going to go there. So on this first trip to India, that's what I was going to do. So I figured out the general area was at, and I found that the YSS ashrams, uh, one of them was in this town close to the cave and they were the caretakers. And uh, so I went there. I was 58 and a, well, almost 59, 58 and a half years old. And I kept thinking about that 29, 59. I didn't, I'm still, that was back in my mind because I was having some problems. Anyway, so I finally got permission. I go to this cave. It's a real long story. Got a video on it. Real long story. But I was having heart problems. I was having epileptic problems. I was having health issues. And when I got up to the cave, did my prayers, meditations, brought on my list of all the people to pray for. And on my way back down, <clears throat> I'm standing at this 30-foot cliff. And all of a sudden, my heart is just pounding. Boom. I mean, you could actually see the shirt going out. And, and I'm getting weaker and weaker. And next thing you know, boom, I black out. And I fall off this 30-foot cliff. Now, it wasn't straight down. It kind of went down. There was a couple of ledges. So I, I took a couple of bounces on the way down. So uh, it wasn't as bad as it sounds. <laughs> but I land on a boulder, a big rock at the bottom, about the size of a Volkswagen car. And I'm laying, looking up at the sky. And I'm not breathing. There's no pulse. There's no nothing. There's no more pain either. And I find myself floating up above my body. And I look down at my body and there's my body laying out on this rock. And I'm, I'm feeling sorry for the body. I feel sorry for that body, but that's not me. You know, I'm, I'm good. And the fact that I'm coming back from Babaji's cave, which was a lifetime goal, I thought, well, you know, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna die, this, this is a good time, it's a good place. I, I've been to Babaji's cave. I made I made good with Babaji. I, I'm feeling great, you know, and, and uh, so be it. But as I'm looking down at my body, this large, large cobra comes out of the grass and it starts crawling over my feet. Now, first time I told this story, uh, I think I said the snake was about six or seven feet. And then a few years later, my wife heard me telling the story and it was this giant cobra. It had to be 12 feet. So, but I don't know how big this, this snake was, but if you ever had a real live wild cobra crawling across your feet, dead or alive down there, it's exciting. But it wasn't fear. All of a sudden, I felt this great love for this cobra. I mean, my heart was just pounding for this Literally, my heart all of a sudden was going to start pounding, right? It was like going into the hospital and they take those paddles, uh, whatever you call them, and they, they put them together and they go, Rear! you know, boom, uh, defibrillator. So it was like somebody took a defibrillator on my, not just my heart, but on my spine. It was like all of a sudden my spine went, Shoom! light, energy, fireworks, explosions, tingly, and my heart just starts pounding and beating and, and, and it's working. And I take a breath and I jump up. And what's the first thing I try to do? I, I try to grab the snake. I'm grabbing the snake in my hand. And the trouble is my hands are like this and they, I can't get my hands together to grab it. They're still not able to grasp. It's bigger than both my hands. So it keeps sliding through. It doesn't turn around and try to get me. It just keeps going. And I keep chasing it through the grass, right? Until it finally slips behind the water, a small trickle of a waterfall. And then I'm looking at that. And I remember the, the chapter in, in the autobiography where it talks about Larry Masha, who had this vision and all this neat stuff happening in a meeting with Babaji. And then he's told to go down and bathe. And there's this little waterfall in the creek. And nobody seems to know where that's at. Well, I was lost when I found this and fell into it. And I'm thinking that thought of that story came to mind. I go, this must have been where he was at. That's supposed to be the place. Anyway, so long story back, I survived being a typical man, 
you would think I would go to a doctor as soon as I could. No, that was in October. I had to finish my trip off until late November. And I started to go to a doctor. January, I'm back home in California. And after having major collapses, I'm having hard problems. I tell my wife, I said, I'm not feeling too good. I'm going to drive to the doctor. You want me to take you? And I go, nah, nah, just minor. I drive myself seven miles, park in this parking lot, go into the ER and have to stand in line. It's America. You got red tape to fill out. Of course, the first question they always ask you, do you have insurance? Uh, <laughs> so I'm in this line. And all this time, I'm having a blown heart attack. It's going crazy, right? But I'm just calm, relaxed. I get up the front of the line. They give me a clipboard, tell me to fill out three pages of questions. First question, do you have health insurance? Yeah, OK. And then I sit down. I get another line. It's got about eight people in it. Another 10 minutes. I get up the front. And this nurse goes, I see a clipboard. And on the clipboard, there's a question that says, why are you coming in today? And I put down, because I'm having a heart attack. And she looks at me, and I'm just like this. I'm having a heart attack. And she looks at me, and she says, well, I'll be the judge of that. Yeah, sit down. So she takes out her stethoscope, and she puts a little thing there, and she goes, sir, you're having a heart attack. I said, yeah, that's what I said. Oh, and then she sets off this code, code, whatever it is, blue code, black code, I don't know. Then put me on a gurney, and they move me out. But I was just like this. I mean, I, I drove, I parked, I stood in line, I filled out the paperwork, I told her what I had, and nobody was doing nothing until they they heard my heart. Then it was like, you know, sirens and whistles and alarms and everybody rolling me down to. Anyway, so I get into the doctor and he's looking at it and everything. And he says, "Yeah, this this is bad, really bad." And so I look at him and I go, "And you know, you know, I don't want to be a victim because I'm never a victim." But I look at him and I'm going. You know, I've, I don't smoke, I don't drink. I don't even do caffeine. I don't do tea, I don't do coffee. Um, I don't do sugar, I don't do salt. I meditate, I, I, I all exercise, I do all these great things. And then he looks at me, and I remember that 2959 thing, right? And then he looks at me and he goes, remember Bill? He says, uh, looking at you, and your genetics and everything, I'm surprised you didn't die at 29 instead of almost 59. And I'm going 29, 59. In other words, the doctors tell me that had I not, had I not taken all those precautions, had I continued to have the same diet I had, I mean, I, at nine years old, I was a vegetarian, only one in my family. So I did all the right things and took care of myself. And it changed it. And what was interesting was I had a friend that I knew in high school. We shared the same birth date, the same hospital, within an hour or two of each other. And our mothers were in the same hospital room together, and we were in the same baby thing together. But we didn't meet until we were much later in life. And we started comparing things and found out that we've known each other since the day we were born, right? So we had the same uh, Vedic chart as I would have, right? Pretty close. He died that year, didn't make 29 or 59, didn't make 59 years old. He smoked, he drank, heavy meat eater, all the above, right? So I started thinking, wow. See, that's why a little knowledge, so for example, let's say you go to a Vedic astrologer, let's say you had your naughty palm leaf done and it says, oh, you're gonna die of, of the cancer in your lungs, you know, 30 years from now and you're a smoker. Well, if you know that and you change and you stop smoking, then you've already changed your whole future. Now, I had a 50 year vision of the future, so maybe I don't quite remember it all, but I think a part of me realized that I had to become a vegetarian. I had to stay away from booze, drugs, alcohol, caffeine, nicotine, sugar, salt, all that stuff. And so that was my second near death experience, but it was a real eye opener because that was also the, the end of my visions from that first near death experience. But it was my third near death experience, which actually 
started and began in Mumbai. I was in Mumbai in 2011 and I was introducing a, a guru at these various venues. He was speaking and giving lectures and he had me give a long introduction of my experiences with them and who he was and all that. And every time I give one, then the next time he'd say, don't add this. It pretty soon ends up me giving an hour, half hour, 45 minute lecture, just an introduction. It should have been like two minutes, right? And he was getting a big kick out of it backstage watching me. Anyway, but I, at one of these events, I had a heart attack and ended up going to ER and, and Mumbai and everything. And just said, you got to go home. So my last day in India that year, I'm sitting at the ashram. I'm in the kitchen. And I feel somebody looking at me. Now, I think everybody here that's watching this has had some sort of this experience. You're in a movie theater. You're some, you know somebody staring at the back of your head. You know it. You can't prove it, but you know it. it's like, like, what are you staring at me? You know somebody's staring at you, right? So it was that feeling, but it was a loving feeling. It wasn't menacing at all. So I'm there, and I turn around, and behind me is the guru of Paramahansa Yogananda, uh, Sivar Teshwar. And he's standing there with his hands behind his back, and then he's folded him. He's looking at me, and he's, it's not like a vision, you know, like it's kind of fady, you know, it's just like there's a body. Like, no, there he is, a body. So I'm looking at that thinking, well, you know, I'm close to death. Maybe there's something going on here, you know, maybe I'm hallucinating or something. So there was a bunch of some people in the room. There was a couple of young, young seekers uh, in a room from Europe. And uh, they were into the, to them, yoga was doing exercises. They weren't really too heavy in the meditation, but I said, these girls, did you guys see anything? And they look at me like I was a crazy man. I see nothing, you know? So, and then there was a, a young man from Texas. And I asked him, I said, can, can you see anything behind me? And he goes, my God, he says, it's, it's just a big, beautiful white light. It's, it's radiating like a sun. I'm, I'm feeling love. I go, okay. So then I asked this other young guy, a lawyer from California. And uh, I said, what do you see? And he said, well, he said, Billy ain't gonna believe me. I said, no, trust me, what do you see? And he described to me exactly what I was seeing. Steve Teshwar standing there with his arms folded, gave me the same exact description I already had seen. And it was ongoing. He's describing it it's just as it's happening. So it was a situation where all these people of different levels and vibrations of belief, of spiritual energy, of acceptance, in the same room with the same thing happening, but everybody picked it up at their level of acceptance. For those that were restless and not meditative, couldn't see nothing, couldn't feel nothing. Somebody else had been meditating a long time and he, he could see light and he could feel love. That's, that's big. And the other guy was able to see the whole thing, which was, I think it was kind of a gift because I, I was looking for a verification and a witness. Because a lot of things happened to me in my life. I mean, lots of stuff happened to me in my life, often. And if you never have any verification, people look at you and say, yeah, he's an Irishman, he's a stalker, right? You know, okay, great stories. So it's always nice when I can share something that I've had witnesses to. So I come back to America, I'm flying back. I collapse at the airport in Denver and customs, six hours with the paramedics trying to get me back. And here's, here's what's crazy. Not only did they, they let me fly from India to Germany to Denver, with me telling them I just had a heart attack and I had medical stuff and I had to go back for stuff. They let me on the airplane. They let me back on this airplane and so after a six hour delay to fly to Sacramento, another two hours. I'm going, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Anyway, so I fly back and I put it in the hospital. There's four days of intensive care before they could even do surgery on my heart. I got just two weeks, I'm gone. So I'm gonna have open heart surgery. They're gonna tear my chest open. They're going to disconnect 
artery to my heart and do bypasses, you know, graft stuff on, which means they're going to stop my lungs and they're going to stop my heart and they're putting me on a heart and lung machine. So the doctor is explaining this to me and I'm going, I said, wait a minute, I'm not breathing. No, my heart's not beating. No. I said, well, then I'm dead. He said, well, we got you on a machine. I said, no, but literally my body's dead. It's just machine doing all the work. He goes, well, yeah, well, we don't look at it like that. I said, okay, all right, just want to get the record straight. You're killing me to save me. He goes, yeah, okay. So he gives me, he's getting ready to give me a shot and put me out. And he tells me, he says, uh, now some people feel a little bit of something because when, when you're on the heart lung machine, we can't give you full anesthesia. Well, he says, but it's only a small percentage, you know, less than 5%. Well, obviously, I was one of those guys that ended up feeling everything going on. <laughs> anyway, so I get the shot. Within seconds, I'm out. Now, here's where the near-death experience happened. Or is it a near-death experience? Or is it a double body experience? Or is it whatever? I'm going to tell you, and you can figure it out. Because it's one of those things that I don't try to analyze, but I'll, what happened was many, let's say a year before that, when I was in India, I got my first naughty palm leaf reading done. And in that palm leaf, it told me that sometime in the future, I meaning just about the time I'm laying on that hospital table, that I was going to be going to a temple in Southern India. And when I get there, I have to walk two to four hours uphill. At the top of that hill, all the rishis, I guess 18 of them are going to be there. They, all the rishis will be there waiting for you. And you won't ask them any questions because you'll know it. They'll just awaken within you the ability. And you, 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 will, you can ask yourself the question, but you know the answer. I thought that was one of the stupidest predictions for naughty palm reading. I'm going, yeah, okay, being a Western guy, going, yeah, great. I, you know, I ain't never going to go to that temple. And that, how's that going to happen? Right. So all of a sudden, Remember, I'm back on that operating table, stark naked, laying on a metal table, and it's about 50 degrees, 45 degrees in there. They got it cold. You can see your breath. <laughs> and all of a sudden, boom, I'm standing in this plaza, this, this like large stone patio area in India. And intuitively, I know this is southern India. And I look at the temple, you know, and it's got... It's got that bowl outside and everything. I go, hey, this is a Shiva temple. I know that much. I'm not stupid. So and then I go, oh, this is that temple I'm supposed to go to right about now. So I'm thinking, well, here I am. Then the next thought being a Westerner, I'm going, do I have any clothes on? So, no, I, I had clothes on. So here I'm having this double body experience or whatever it was, but I'm fully clothed. So I thought a little modesty struck me at the moment. Anyway, so I start walking uphill. And uh, two, four hours. I, you know, I got time. It's going to operate on I me. Mean, it's going to be eight hours or so in the operation. So I got time. And I get up the top of this hill. And, and I'm bumping into people. And it's actually physical. People see me. It's not like I'm invisible. People are seeing me, touching me. I'm bumping in. So, and I'm actually walking. I mean, I, I physically feel my body. And every once in a while, I feel stuff inside my chest like hands and tools. And so I could feel the operation, but I'm there in India walking in my body up this hill. Get to the top, and at the top, there's this clearing, few trees, some stumps, a campfire, and some people sitting on logs and rocks around it. And there's about, I don't know, about 18 or 19 people. And, uh, and I walk over, I figure, hey, I don't need an invitation. I, I'm supposed to be here. So I just sit down and I joined the group. And there with them was uh, this guru from India that sent me to that naughty reading way back. Or not. So he's there. He's got his arms folded. He's looking at me. And, and he's looking at me and says, you can skip a beat, but don't give up your heart. That'd be great. So I'm, I'm there and I'm, I'm just enjoying this. And when I, when I went into that operation, there was a part of me that was in so much pain and so weak and experienced so much physical stuff over that last several months. And there was a part of me that said, you know, if I go, 
Yeah, it's okay. I mean, I was not fighting that hard. I mean, it was just not that I want to die, but it was like the fight for staying alive was painful. So that's all going through my head. And next thing you know, there's this cloud coming. You know, that light in the cloud again. I go, oh, here we go again. This is entertaining. I'm, I'm easy. I don't. I expect it. I'm, okay, great. Another what's this, another show coming? And all of a sudden, this beautiful feminine voice comes out of this light. I have to assume it was a, a, a feminine a woman. It had that quality that it sounded like a 25 year old woman. I mean, it was just beautiful, like an angel. And she goes, Bill, you don't have to do anything anymore. You, you finished your karma, you've done enough. You, you know, you've helped everybody that, that you were supposed to help. You know, let your heart go. <laughs> Just give it up, right? Just, I'll take you. I promise you bliss, joy, peace, no pain. That's it. You, you, you got the magic ticket, basically. Just come with me. We got to go, right? And meanwhile, Gordon standing there like that's going, yeah. You could skip a beat, you know, but don't give up your heart, you know. And, and, and he kept going on, right? And I'm going, I said, I said, I said, wait a minute. I said, why should I stay? He says, because there's more pain and suffering for you. And I'm going, why would I choose that over bliss and joy and peace? He says, well, you need to have this pain and you need to have all the suffering so you can learn how to handle it and teach others. Because up until now, up until that time in my life, things happened painful. Like it was just getting out of my mind. It was gone. Boom. It was, it was always a bliss out thing. It was not a big deal. And he's telling me, no, from now on, you got more pain you ever had before. It'd be more intense. So that's what he's offering. I said, wait a minute. You're offering me pain and suffering. She's offering me peace, bliss, and love. He goes, yeah. I go, why else would I want to, want to go back? And so then he kind of does this. And this whole clouds turns out to be a sea of faces. Indians, Europeans, Americans, Asians, you name it. There was even a few animals in there. But it was all these different people internationally from around the world. And I was basically being told that if, if you're gone, then none of these people will get your gift. Whether the gift's just a smile, a kind word, an inspiration, an understanding, a physical, mental, spiritual healing, a teaching, an idea, you will touch these people's lives in some way. And then they, in causing their own ripples on the pond of their lives, will touch all these other people. And those people will be touched. And those people will be touched. So by you leaving, even though you have no obligation, all these people will be missing that gift. Oh, well, man, what kind of... Uh, anyway, so meanwhile, so he keeps telling me, don't skip a beat and all this stuff. Then all of a sudden, they defibrillate my body on the operating table. Because all of a sudden, I'm there talking to everybody, watching this, and all of a sudden, my body goes... Hurr! The next thing you know, boom. And I'm naked on a stainless steel, cold metal table, with them, got my heart started. And they're, they're sewing me up and trying to put my rib cage back and all this other stuff. My lungs are starting up. And I'm in god awful pain. More pain than I ever had. <laughs> it was just, I, I said, well, there's the first promise. They didn't lie. There's pain, there's suffering. Anyway, so uh, over the next 10 days or so, every time I went to sleep, or close my eyes, or relax, I would be back on that mountaintop in India. And I'd have the same thing all over again. Same temptation, same sea of faces, which uh, I, I, I'm finding every, every week, 
or two, I see new faces like, oh, oh man, okay. And some people contact me, I don't want I'm contacting you. And then I just send me a photo. I look at it and I go, yeah, okay. You know, I don't have to wonder why. All right. I know. They don't have to know, but I know. So this went on. And then finally, about the 10th night, I was five blood transfusions. I was dying. They're getting ready to take me away uh, to do some more treatments and stuff. And my phone rings by the bedside. It's 1130 at night. And I, and I insisted on getting that. I'm doing a gurney being taken out of the room. I insisted on answering the phone. I answered the phone. And I heard his voice saying, yeah, this is Gornoff in India. And I'm thinking, he has to tell me he's in it. How many Gornoffs do I know? I mean, I don't know one. You know, anyway, so, and then first thing out of his mouth is, yeah, you can skip a beat. But don't give up heart. And I'm going, what? 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 And then. That's still not enough for me. I'm still thinking, I'm just gonna, I'm just throwing it in. I would, the desire to keep fighting was not that strong. And then he goes, yeah, I just told a hundred people or so here to go up to the temple and pray for you. Cause I told them I was going to heal you. You wouldn't want to embarrass me, would you? That was it. 36 hours later, I was out of the hospital. <laughs> oh my God, I can't die. You can't, you can't embarrass the guru by dying. So that's like one of those unwritten rules, I believe. How much time do I got? Do we got time for more? Or are we about running out? Yeah, no no problem, Bill. Uh, would you like to take some questions or you want to continue yes. for some time? No, yes. Okay, so if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. There's one. Sorry. Mukul Bhavi, please start your video. Yeah, go ahead, Mukul Bhavi. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so inspirational. Absolutely amazing, Reverend Bill. Absolutely amazing. Um, and my question here is, that why are you the gifted person? Why did you see your life at the age of eight? And I'm, I mean, there are so many of us who undergo various near-death experiences, right? But everybody has not seen the future or don't get, uh, you know, uh, the knowing that, okay, this is what you need to do or don't see gurus and et cetera. So why is it, it, why is it you? I mean, right. at, at the age of eight, you've not meditated, right? After a few years, yes, it's different. Since, since I was two years old. Sorry? Since I was meditating since I was at least two. Okay. Well, I can't remember uh, I was not meditating. I, I made it up. I did my own things. When mm -hmm. I was like two years old, I used to take and push my eyes together so the eyes would focus here. I'd see colors and lights and spiritual eye. I thought, well, that's really kind of neat. And then I'd put my ears, you know, my thumbs in my ears, and then I would hear this, oh, all these beautiful sounds. And uh, so and I just thought everybody did that stuff when I was a kid. <laughs> but anyway, okay. uh, so why me? So first off, nothing is random in the universe. Mm -hmm. I doesn't look down and say, this guy is going to be born rich. He's going to be a billionaire. This guy's going to mm -hmm. be a pop. This one's going to be crippled. This one's going to be an athlete. You know, mm -hmm. this one's spiritual. No, everything you have, you earned. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And it's it's just a matter of when you started and how, how much effort you made. But since there is no time and space, it's all now. You're already a self-realized master. You're already an enlightened being in a new now. It's already happening. Okay, yeah. You're stuck in this now thinking this is real. But it's it's only no more real than the future of you. It's all, it's all one. So all my life, I've had this great trust that God will give me what I need. 
not what I want. Yeah. What Absolutely. I need. So I never complain. It's like, you know, I will, I'm hungry, so I get fed. I don't care if it's peanut butter sandwich or if it's a salad or, you know, whatever. You know, somebody's going to take care of me. So I don't dictate. The, well, when I was young, I used to, I used to, <laughs> I was a, little, as a kid, I used to, hey, look, here's, but as an adult, I don't treat God as yeah. Santa Claus. I go to mm -hmm. God because I love the, the divine. So I don't go to God for powers, cities, balance, nothing. When I pray, I pray for give me understanding so I can help others, or you can help others through me. It's, whatever. it's never me. It's give me the tools I need. Use me. Give me those people coming into my life today that need my my words that you give me. That's like when I, I give this speech, I usually ramble on the first five, six, seven minutes because I want to get a feeling for the group who's there. And I know that what this group needs to hear will be what is said. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've given keynote speeches on uh, in thousands of people and stuff. And, and people, I, I go with no notes, nothing prepared. And it's never the same. It's all over the place. But it really depends when I when I usually focus on one or two or three people mm -hmm. and I get in that group. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're having trouble. They're having trouble dealing with death in the family. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that might be something I might talk about as people are losing people. Even like now, you know, it's of course. people are yes. dealing with. But so that's why I decided to. You know, if I tell about a near death study and you know near death situation experience, people will realize that death is not the end. It's just a door. It's it's all transformation. It's just from one to the other. You burn a body, there's ash. You still got something, right? But none of that's the body. The body was never that. Mm -hmm. So we're never really created. We always are. We always will be. This whole thing is a dream. Unfortunately for all of us that have egos, that's all of us, we believe this dream is real. Therefore, we have a body. Therefore, we have birth. Therefore, we have death. We have illness. We have suffering because we believe it all. Yes. But true, none of that's happening. Yeah. Not real. Nobody dies. Nobody got killed yes. in the war. Nobody's died of COVID. None of this. So people ask me, well, obviously you believe in reincarnation. I said, I don't even believe in incarnation let alone reincarnation, because this is God's dream. Each of us is a drop in the ocean, but we're not, you know, we're the ocean. We think we're that drop, right? So we think we're this one individualized dream when it's we're God's entertainment. Beautiful. Some of us have nightmares and some of us have beautiful dreams. We do have free will. And that's how... We end up, we either choose the path to enlighten ourselves or we choose the path for sex, money, fame, fortune, ego, and all things that go with that. Right. And it's the last great temptations. I mean, think of the great gurus in India right now. I mean, it's like an industry there. Everybody's a guru. But you got guys out there, it's like, it's like, it's like a business, you know, get your YouTube channel going, you know, get your books out there. Send me your green little dead presents on, on a little piece of paper, like money, right? You know, give them to me. Uh, I don't need any more money. I mean, come on. So, <laughs> but how many have been entangled in, 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 in controversy? You know, it's, and, and I'm just saying, well, that's because they're humans. So when you look at people like that, you should say, you know, they're trying. They're trying to be the best. They're trying to teach. They're trying to give love. Some give some beautiful stuff and they still have, they still fail at a human level. Well, you know what? Forgive them, move on. Let's get, we're all there. But nobody, if you got a body, you're not perfect. That's why I I'm tell listening. people, mm -hmm. you're looking for the real guru. That guru that you're worshiping, that outside person, that, that person you're, you're looking at his body and his face and his personality. Mm -hmm. Guru within him is the same one that you got within you. God. And every time you reach outside yourself to solve your problems, you're missing the thing about helping yourself. But having a guru, a master, a mentor, a teacher, 
uh, somebody that can help facilitate your change and, and inspire you, I think is necessary. You need somebody out there to direct you. Yes. But it's like going to the, you go into the gym to work out, right? And you've seen pictures of Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, I go there and I go, oh, I want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? It's like I go to this guy, he's an expert. He's in the gym and he's, he's, he runs the gym and he's an expert at all these physical stuff. I go, I want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to, I'm making you my, 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 my workout guru and I'm putting you in charge. You lift all my weights because that's what you're supposed <laughs> to do for me. I'm going to go sit over there and in a year or two, I'm going to look like Arnold. So people go to the guru and they go, you're the guru, take all my karma. Right. Take, the pain, <laughs> take it away. And they don't do any work. Mm -hmm. well, it works this way. If you do everything you're supposed to do, yes, hundred yes. percent of what you're supposed to do, then the guru can help you add a little to that, and then God's grace will take care of the rest. But unless you're doing something, you're not getting anywhere. Hope that answers your answer question. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Another question, Aparijita. Please go ahead. Please unmute. Yeah. Very inspirational, Reverend Bill. In fact, you know, not only are you able to understand and tune into the energy of the audience, you're also able to tune into our questions because my question was exactly on the point of finding your guru. So in terms oh. of, like you mentioned, you know, at the age of eight, you had kind of a vision of how your life would unfold. And then only when your karma kind of got neutralized at the age of 59, you saw significant transformations in your life. So my question was more in terms of when was it that you actually met your guru or was it already in the inner world you were communicating with him? Because obviously there was someone who was guiding your, you know, highly evolved soul in terms of the techniques and in terms of how to live your life. So the question that I had was, you know, when and how did you connect and find your true guru? All right. So let's. Because I, I did a video on this, and I, and I say in the video, this is a Western perspective. Now I'll give you something a little deeper. Because I mean, I got all kinds of levels of people watching that. I, I think if you can find the true guru, which may be a true guru for this time and place for decades or whatever, but things change. You evolve, they die, things happen. You know, you, you move on, you, you evolve as well. Uh, but I think loyalty to, if you find somebody and you're loyal, and you treat that guru as if they were God, they could be, you don't know what their personal life's like. None of them. You know, they could be hypocrites. You don't, but if you worship the God in them, the God inside that guru, and you see a guru as that God manifested, then you truly see the face of God by looking at your guru. Now, how you find one? Truth of the matter is, you think you find them. They find you. When the student is ready, the guru comes, the teacher comes, right? They knock on your door. It looks like you're searching for them. It looks like, well, geez, I just happened to find this YouTube video. I just happened to find this book. This person didn't have to mention this name. Oh, this feels good. This feels I'm telling you, a lot of it is feeling because you could you could be a hundred gurus. And if they don't move you at some level emotionally, and I mean that emotionally, spiritually, emotionally, if, they, if you're not feeling that, probably not the one you're looking for. But sometimes you go to somebody and it's like, man, that's like a, this sounds familiar. I, we have a connection, you know? I really think this thing is from lifetime to lifetime. As your guru advances, you advance, the students follow. To some degree, you may change, evolve. But I think there's no accidents when you watch a certain YouTube video, no accident when you read a book, no accidents. It's wisdom, not intelligence, when it comes to picking. Again, you think you're picking. The guru picks. So then, real question gets down to you could follow a live guru or a dead guru. Personally, I think you need to follow both. Uh, I follow Yogananda, that's my guru. But I got 
I've got live, you know, grown up. I got others. I got people that I, I mean, they're BFFs, right? I mean, they're like best friends forever. I mean, it's like you want these people in your life because they're giving you something. There's those that shock you, they give you that energy, that and literally the energy they give you. And so anytime you can sit at the feet of or in a room with uh, somebody's considered a great master, teacher, guru, go. But it's just the energy alone, if they're really true, the energy alone will uplift you and change your vibration. So I think the greatest friendship, the greatest relationship in the world, the greatest divine romance is when a, a devotee finds their true guru. But it's not easy. If you read an autobiography of a yogi, he went to a bunch of other gurus before he met Stephen Teshwar. And Stephen Teshwar didn't treat everybody great. He was strict, stern. Some people need that. Some people, they, they've had a rough life. They don't need that. They, they want somebody, to love. they want a loving mother. They want something different. It's what you need. What you need, not necessarily what you want. So yeah, continue the search. And I say the best way to find a guru is when you, when you do your meditations and prayer, just say, I'm here, find me. I'm here, find me, just find me. Just visualize that light coming to you. And then trust your instincts, trust your intuition. Wonderful. Sometimes, thank you. We have another question, Reverend. You want to continue? Yeah. Contact me afterwards. I'll tell you more. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next question. Right. And Lakshmi, please go ahead. Um, uh, hello, uh, I'm Anand Lakshmi. I wanted to ask a small question: the free will and love. How do we always be with that? You know, how do I always know that here I have a free will and I have to act from a place of love or deep knowing that this is my free will? How do I do that? Because in the beginning, you said that you'll have so many situations in life and none of it is like a punishment or something. And how do I face everything in my life with my free will? with deep love, which we are given by our creator or whoever we call as source. Okay. I was having trouble hearing that. Uh, uh, yeah, so she's asking, I... Reverend, she's asking about free will. And why do we manifest because of our free will all the troubles that we go through? Really? By, yeah. yeah. No. What yeah. was that? No, no, no. I was asking when we have free will, how do oh, I always will. remember? How do I always remember that I have free will and that I should act from a place of love and compassion? Because now that I know there is a free will, like you said, whatever happens in our life is happening for a good, not to, you know, indulge us in any kind of uh, unwanted. Uh, emotions or experience okay let's let's talk about in general free will and then we'll get into pieces of this people have this thing especially if you, if you had your naughty palm done or you get a vedic chart done and you go well where's my free will and i try to tell people that's what created the chart that's what created the reading everything that happened in that naughty reading was your free will from previous lifetimes and from this lifetime everything you thought everything you dreamt even your dreams create karma and uh, your actions, all that adds up and it creates your future, creates the now. So you gotta ask yourself, if somebody's high on cocaine, how much free will do they have left? <laughs> you know, is it, but they still got, they almost have to get to that dying place when they're in jail and they're, and they're kicking and screaming and they're trying to get sober, where well, they got to go, okay, okay, we can abuse our free will and do bad things. And I mean, quote unquote, bad things. But with drugs, and I don't know why I'm talking about this, but with drugs and alcohol and psychedelics and mushrooms and all these things, it's not that the people are doing. They have the wrong desire. Their desire is to feel good and get blissful. 
Again, I understand that, but they're using the wrong tool. They're taking a shortcut that's going to hurt them. So they're misusing their free will in a way, um, but free will is what separates us from God because if you really start your day and end your day with, what do you want me to do, Lord? I surrender my free will to you. Use me. Use me. Like you said, oh, I don't even want to go. No. I don't want to forgive. No. God wants you to forgive. God wants you to do that work. So that's the level you got to get on. You have to be able to surrender your free will. When you can surrender your free will, then you have the power of having proved me well. And your free will becomes God's will. One. That's the ultimate. All right. Hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, yes. That's exactly like I have been feeling. And I would love to tell you that I have been following you. The day I saw your, heard your video, I you were on a program with this uh, network, Awareness Network. And I was feeling very blessed that I saw you the very day I heard of the whole whole uh, you know story about you and i'm so i'm feeling blessed and thanks a lot for being here for us thank you so much thank you lakshmi yes kavita didi please go ahead namaste reverend bell it's amazing okay. story <laughs> on a lighter note i'm just a little curious so you have a lot of these strings and drums on the in the background so do you really play oh, them so or junk I got a trumpet back there. I got a Native American flute that was hand carved by an yes. American for me. I got drums. I got ukulele. Mm -hmm. I got, you yeah, know, yeah. Like, doesn't mean I doesn't mean I'm good at them. It just means that I play for me, my own joy, my own pleasure, and I don't I don't publicly ever. But um, it's um, during this last year, I had all this time around the house. <laughs> in between helping people, and then I, you know, I pull around and you know play. To me, music is no matter what culture you go to. I don't care if it's primitive, out in the jungles, if it's in the deserts, if it's in the cities. Every culture in this world throughout history has had music, right? Yes. Yes. They all have instruments of some kind, and drum is like around the world, right? And and some kind of flute. They all made a flute. They all made a string instrument. It's amazing to me. Music is a part of God's expression. Mm -hmm. And no matter how poorly I do it, I hear it, I hear it good. It's good to me, but for everybody else, my wife goes, Oh my God, you're gonna do that again. Close the door. You know. But uh, anyway, so that's that's what it is. And I I I've got you know Yogananda the picture sitting back there, and that mm -hmm. one there is like I don't know, 50 some years old or older. I had a special experience with that picture, which we could talk about it sometime. But uh, that's that's it. And I got uh, some of my Native American friends have left me some things there. Yeah, I got another room full of stuff. What I do is I get gifts all the time from people. You know, they'll give me feathers, mm -hmm. they'll give me special rocks, crystals, neat stuff. And, and I use stuff personally for about six months. And when I have, you know, bangles, you know, three three different metals also. But then when somebody comes and they're, they're hurting or something, I take off the bangle, I give it to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I give these things. I got these these dog tags made and it says, I am love, and it's got Latin on it. And mm -hmm. it's basically love conquers all. And I give these to people. I call them my spiritual warriors. Go out, help others, you know. And I, I said, you're officially tagged, go. But, um, and I like them to wear it because it says, you know, I am love. And if, you, if you've done any research on the internet, there's a Japanese uh, scientist, water scientist, uh, Emoto was his name. And he did these frozen water crystals. Mm -hmm. And he'd take a bottle of water and he'd put the mm -hmm. word love, don't know what language is there, and he put love on that bottle of water. And it would change those crystals into these beautiful yeah. formations. And if he put hate on there, they would get ugly and, you know, and yeah. deform. So, I same idea that words, words have energy and power. The fact that on my dog tags, it says, I am love. 
-hmm. There's too many people are going, oh, I'm a victim. I'm an alcoholic. I'm awful. I'm unlucky. Give me the Lord for even saying those. Anyway, what would you say? I am love. Mm -hmm. And you got it hanging on next to your body. That's like labeling your body, which is mostly water. Yeah. You're going to change the energy of your body. Exactly. So if you ever, ever come to America, if I come there, I'll give you one if you want one. Anyway, I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kavita Didi. Ravi Jaiji, please go ahead. Has been a wonderful talk, Reverend Bill. Grateful thanks to you for imparting a lot of knowledge. One thing, one single thing which can help you in your life in growing in totality. At the end, what we understand it, it is the spiritual growth. What one single thing should be done on a regular basis by an individual to reach some better spirituality levels? If I was going to teach one single thing, and this is a shame that in America, I got to teach people to love. But love and forgiveness, I don't care how much meditation you do. I mean, you could do, and you could have powers. You could do astral travel. You could do all these, you could walk through a wall. You could do all these things. You could walk on fire. You could, do, all those things are nothing if you have no love. If you can't forgive your worst enemy and love them, you've got the door closed between you and God because God is in all those hearts. But you got to love the trees. You got to love the rocks. You got to love your teeth. You got to love everything. It's all God. So if there's just one thing I tell people, become childlike. Stop overthinking your life. Stop analyzing everything. Like I go out there and I give somebody a real simple meditation and they spend the next four hours to give me, well, you know, analyze it for me by doing this right. I said, look, just do it. I don't give the back straight or just do it. I don't say this right. Don't, God don't, just love God. And so I also tell people when you meditate, don't meditate for any cities, powers, don't meditate for self-realization fellowship. Don't meditate for blitz. Nothing. Go into meditation as a time to spend loving the Lord. Whatever, whatever, and it doesn't matter if you think it's Lord Shiva, Babaji, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna. It doesn't matter. It's all God. And God don't, he's not a jealous God, doesn't care how you imagine. God to be, there's no man alive that knows what God looks like. None. Anybody can give you a lecture. Oh, this is what God is. We don't got male, female, a thing, light, energy. To me, God is love. And love is energy and love is light and love is everything that holds this world together. So if you were if you were spending any time with me, we we're taking a camping trip here in California. We're in Yosemite National Park, and we're sitting along a campfire, which I do with people once in a while. We're sitting there on a campfire, and it's you know it's two o'clock in the morning. I'm just going to tell you I'm all about loving God. It's just about loving God. When I go to India, I'm always amazed. I go to an ashram someplace, and the guru's sitting there, where he's got a fire going. And all the Westerners, I mean, all the Germans and English and the French and the Australians and the Americans, and everybody's got a thousand questions to ask this guru when they have an opportunity presented to just sit next to the fire with them in silence. That's why I find I get up in the morning two, three, sometimes four hours before sunrise. Just the silence of the moment. It's a God time. It's best time to exercise, best time to meditate, best time to write, best time to think, best time to resolve things. It's that, especially the two hours before sunrise. Yeah. I don't know what that's got to do anything, but there you go. Hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Grateful thank you. How about love? 
Sherry, please go ahead. Please unmute. Hello. Um, I have a question. I've kind of had a similar situation where I was given the chance to come back and, you know, be here again. And I guess I was curious as to how did you know your purpose when you came back? Or was there something that was clear? Let's, let's talk about purpose because let's include everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got that question. Okay, I got, I, I got another chance. I came back. You know, why? How come? What I got to do? That just presents a, a, a time for you to go, okay, I got to explore this now. Now I got to... Most people come into life and they don't really dig too deep into that, but they should. Real seekers, that's their first question. What is my purpose? What's my dharma? Why am I here? Is it just entertainment? Is it just to get high and fly and have a good time? And I'm telling you. Well, go ahead. I I, I'm sorry. I remember being asked or told I could go home, and I just responded I had too much work. So obviously, that's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> the work. Right. Yeah, because that's your higher self talking there. And uh, if it were if it were really your time, here's the thing. Mm. Remember I talked about you think you're chasing the guru, the guru's coming for you. You think, well, I got a reprieve. I went back. It was my choice. Was it really? Uh, I'm one of these people who believe he kind of made a contract before he came into the lifetime. This present mm. lifetime. Uh, he had to stop certain things. And unless you committed suicide or did something, you know, to destroy that contract. Uh, I didn't, basically. but that <laughs> I had I had a story like yours, so it's yeah. been an adventure. <laughs> when you reach a point and you had a time out, you had a near death experience, that's the time for somebody to kind of remind you what your purpose was. Your higher self knows what it is, and ultimately, the purpose of everyone is love and service. And that's one, actually, if you, you got to love your serving anyway. But some people try to say, well, there's service, there's love. I said, okay, we'll make it two things. But to me, it's just love. It's mm -hmm. really loving your serving. And when you reach that point in time, we realize that everything is of service. If you're working in a grocery store and you're packing the bags and you, and you smile at somebody, you, you might have brightened somebody's day. If you help a beggar, if, you, uh, if you're a school teacher and you teach somebody something, if you're a parent and, and, you, and you, do, you teach your children and you raise them, that's all loving service. You know, you don't have to be a Nobel Prize winner in peace, you know, to be serving humanity. Everything at the smallest level serves humanity. By you going within and looking at what you need to change within you changes the outside world too many people especially what i call my new age friends they're, they're healers they're this they're that they're 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 coaches they're this that that's all great but ultimately they have to realize that they are really not any of that that they're only facilitating mm. the healing they're only facilitating the advice they're only a conduit which it flows through to others all kinds of the story so True service is just surrendering your will to God. Use me. Mm. Now, everybody, there's some people come to this world and they're here to create great art. I mean, that's really a, it's a thing. I mean, that art inspires other people. Or maybe they make movies, or maybe they write books, or maybe they crochet and knit and, and do these beautiful quilts that inspire people. Or maybe they're just one of the most wonderful teachers you've ever had, or, or the greatest, you know, saxophone player, or whatever. Everything, if it's given from the heart, can truly really be a gift to the world. And you may you may brighten the world just for your own family. That's good. Mm -hmm. Maybe your neighborhood, maybe the whole, maybe greater audiences. It doesn't matter. But like I was talking about earlier in that experience, where the ripples on the pond. You raise your children and they turn out to be beautiful people, then more likely they're going to raise beautiful people because they've been inspired by what they've been given and it goes out seven generations. 
Mm -hmm. By the same token, you do evil, and you, you and that goes out equally as negative energy as the pond of life. I hope that answers your question. Yes, but thank you. You come back. Service is what you're supposed to do. You know intuitively what it is, but don't look for the great. It's only this. It's only that. It's the collective of your life that serves the greater good. Mm -hmm. Live a life that's godly. That serves the greater good. Your energy mm -hmm. changes change those around you. Thank you. And Thank you, Sherry. Good to see you, Sherry. You always log in first and we never get to see you. But it was nice to see you. For, for it's always thing. too early in the morning, but thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Reverend, we've got two questions uh, in the chat. So one question says that if you could heal the your fractured tooth and take the pain away by sending it love, why not heal your heart in a similar way? All right, let's talk about karma. Let's talk about a lot of things. First off, if you don't think about in America, they got this thing, a lawyer should never defend himself. If he's a lawyer and he's charged with something, a lawyer never defends himself in court. Doctor never treats themselves. They always have an outside doctor. Healers don't heal themselves. Uh, first off, I surrender to the universe that whatever happens is supposed to happen. So I can't then go to the, the person, that, the creator, and say, hey, wait a minute. You, you, you did this to me. Take it away. No, I just say, you gifted me this. How can I use this? How do I use this broken tooth to help others? How do I serve you? Beautiful. Yeah, because I didn't pray for healing. I just gave my teeth love, and the, and, the, and they just took away the pain. Is uh, okay. We love you back. So, healing yourself is a whole different thing. People, you know, it's like, oh, you're in pain. No, no, and and honestly. There's a lot of people out there, just healers jump on people because their things are happening. And they try to take away all this karma from people. When you get sick or injured, you're working off karma. You better have the wisdom to know that when you're taking away this, you haven't created a greater problem because now how do they work that karma out? They just delayed it someplace else. Now, if you're a doctor and that's your job, that's God giving you that, that's okay. But you know, I'm just giving you a theory on this. Yep. But nothing is like it seems. Sometimes healing somebody is the wrong thing to do, and you have to have the wisdom to know when and when not to. I have a video of that, by the way, when and when not to heal. Because that's take wisdom, not knowledge. Not just because you love somebody. Not because you want to give. But you have to have the wisdom to say no. Yeah. And that's hard. That was a hard lesson for me. Yep. Connecting to the highest state and then asking. Yes, Smita, go ahead, please. Hello. Um, we often get dreams. So how, which of the dreams need real attention and which is like a minor thing and we let go? Okay. Give me, give me a, a translation. I had trouble. I'm, I'm hard of hearing. Yeah. So uh, she's asking that we have dreams and how Dream. do we understand what the dreams mean? And okay. which dream should we pay attention to? All right, let me ask you a question. Have you had a recent dream that's fresh in your mind that's bothering you? I, do, I often get dreams. I mean, and I get like sometimes people, sometimes colors, sometimes snakes, sometimes, I mean, it can be anything. Like I get people in the dreams whom I haven't spoken to even for like three years, four years, like. I mean, in my conscious world, they won't be anywhere in my map as such. In my All right, let's, let's, talk, let's talk dreams. Depending on your vibrational level when you're sleeping, because some people will meditate for a couple hours before they go to bed. So their dreams are going to be different than somebody's dreams that just watch television, had some coffee, you know, been jumped into bed, you know, and then they have a, a dream. Because that's going to be mostly in the subconscious mind. Okay. But if you're meditating before you go to sleep, then you're kind of mixing the, the higher levels of your awareness, you know, your higher consciousness, with your subconscious. 
and how much subconscious is involved in that depends on your resistance because some people a vision could come to them and some prophecy could come to them and some real teaching could come to them if they were totally open to everything but most people their subconscious mind is still kind of fighting these things so they have a they'll have a clown in the dream that's or some weird things and they go what but at some level those things represent some repressed part of your subconscious all right and you can get into all kinds of crazy stuff on that but if you got a general theme going most of our dreams are a way for us to work our problems out that we didn't work out in the conscious mind during the daytime so they're still there now the more evolved you are your dreams are a way of prophesizing warning you or giving you gifts of knowledge or giving you some wisdom, giving you a little advice. Or if you're really into it and you recently lost somebody in the last year or two, sometimes you still got a connection with somebody who's passed away and they'll show up in a dream for some reason. And they're, oh, you're still thinking good, pleasant thoughts about somebody or whatever, and they'll come in your dream. So there's so many levels. Because I, I analyze dreams once in a while when somebody has a really unusual dream. And, and uh, it's, if you get one of those dream books, they don't work. These dream books say, well, if you have an owl, that means that. If you have a trumpet in the dream, it means this. If you have a moon, it means that. If you have a guru in the dream. What these things represent to you, the dreamer. That's the clothing that you put on your dream. That's the dream you create. So my advice, when you have a dream, because you don't really remember much of a dream when you wake up and at 10 minutes go by you don't remember nothing unless something really bothered you just a highlight so keep a notepad or a tape recorder or something by your bed and as soon as you conscious log it you know here, here's my dream boom, 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 boom. see if there's a pattern see if there's ongoing things going on and, and then you as the guru within yourself take a look at it what does it really mean to you? Having this person that you dreamt about that you haven't talked about or seen in three years, why are they coming back? Did that person uh, hurt your feelings or did you miss this person with your love that didn't happen? Uh, that person reminds, reminds you of an old way of life or something you used to do that was fun, whatever it is. Take a look at that and analyze it. Dreams are a tool. So it's a shame not to try to remember them and learn from them. Okay, two levels. There's a spiritual level of the dream, and then there's a subconscious psychology of the dream. Most people don't get past the psychology. You know, they're into the you know the Freud. Oh, that's all about sex. You know, Freud. You know, you're dreaming about this. That has all these meanings. You got to dig deeper sometimes. Don't take it literally though, because everything's symbolic. Hope that answers your question. Smita, are you okay? Yeah, yeah. Thank you okay. very much. Great. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Anyone else with a question? Okay, I guess we are done, uh, Reverend. So thank you so much for the lovely conversation that we that you had with us. It was really, really beautiful, and I think it touched many of our hearts. I, I apologize for wrestling with my window. This light yeah, that's coming. perfectly all right. It was, it was, it was the light shining on me. I was by the light. It was like, huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's one more question. Madhvi, can we have your video, please? Yeah. Yeah, Madhvi. One second. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Madhvi, unmute, please. There we go. Go ahead. Oops. You Perhaps. muted yourself. Unmute. There. Now? Yeah, yep. go ahead. Namaste, sir. I, I just feel like saying thank you and I love you a lot. I don't know why. It's just very, very strong feeling that I have been having since the time you've started speaking. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. What's, thank uh, you. Thank you uh, for saying you. thank you. How long have you been with this group? Me? 
um, for about less than a year now. Eleven so, years? No, no. Less Reverend, we started. We started going on Zoom in March last year. Oh, okay. So, so, yeah, so I it's did. been about a year and two months. But Awareness Foundation has been going for the last 10 years now. So there are various people here on the call who've been with us for 10 years. But most of the people have joined on Zoom. So, you know, they are here with us for about a year. So let me, let me say this about the group. This group you've created feels very much like a family of souls. There is connections here at some level. Uh, there's, there's, it's, it's greater than it appears to be. And, and it was like, you say, in some ways, the group, the group itself acts as its own guru, because what I see is the group evolution from what you guys are contributing and giving and taking and back and forth and learning and experiencing together. So it's like a ball. Everybody's on this ball and the ball's rolling, but everybody's getting there together. So it's like you're gathering this energy together. So in an essence, you are this one group guru. And, uh, and then each of you got your own little things going, but this coming together is a beautiful thing. I'd like to see more of this. This is one of the things from the pandemic that turned out to be a gift. A lot of people, oh, this thing is terrible. You know, and I look back and I go, some families have really pulled together um, people have learned to spend time alone and with each other uh, and trying to figure out constructively what to do with their time and their energy. A lot of people have meditated more. People have discovered Zoom and all its forms. And we found out that I don't have to travel all around the world. I'm reaching more people now this last year than I did. I mean, I reached uh, about a million people last year, you know, on Zoom and on my YouTube channel. I couldn't do that. You know, if I'm going to India, my biggest crowd was only 5,000 people. And it wasn't for me, it was for the guru. And when I go out, I get a five, six, seven hundred people, and I'm going, ooh, you know how many audiences I have to do to get a million? I mean, but on YouTube, I get, you know, I get over a million. I'm going, what? It was a tool I didn't realize was this powerful because I can reach out to people. Uh, in their homes and their comfort when they're open and they're ready. And, uh, and also I finish this, boom, 30 seconds later, I'm downstairs with my wife, my life goes on. And uh, so I just wanna thank all of you. I'm sending you out my love, my blessings and, uh, and my prayers to all of you. Um, I, I just want you to know that this was special and it was appreciated. I enjoyed it as much as you guys enjoyed having me. So, so, so Reverend, in, in awareness, we actually call it a family. So anyone who joins any of our sessions becomes part of the family. So you hit it right on the head. So we uh, are we a got, family. You got, you, got, you got one guy, you got a guy on board, you got a guy from Wales there, James Thomas, is he online? I, I don't know. James, if you're online, can you please raise your hand? It is just... So I don't know yeah, James is here. Him. James is here. Okay, so I, I, I request let him join your family. I think he's ready. Yep. I, I, th I think he'd get something out of this. Uh, and uh, he's a friend of mine. And when I went, when I traveled, when I traveled to uh, the UK in 2016, yeah, uh, painted his home with his lovely family. It was a wonderful experience. And so I just want to reach out to him and say thank you, James. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah, so James, please send me a WhatsApp message and then we'll add you to the groups. Uh, it's there on the chat. I don't know if you've got it. I'm putting it back on the chat. Thank you. Can and you anytime you want me back, just whistle. Absolutely. There's no question on that. We will have you back. And uh, of course, we will be in touch, Reverend. Beautiful okay. having you here. Thank you so much for coming on board. Okay. And, and as soon as you've touched awareness, you're part of the family too. All right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Tomorrow we've got our regular sessions. We've got pranayam in the morning, then book reading, meditation, uh, etc. It'll be all posted on the virtual group, so please look out.
Thank you so much, Reverend, once again. Thank you, everyone, for joining this session. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Reverend.